Hi, everyone. Welcome to the NAFA webinar series. I am Tigris Osborne. I am NAFA's Director of Community Outreach and Chair of the Board. Um, this is the first episode of our 2021 webinar series. Yay! And today's episode is part of a three-part series we're doing specifically looking at um, life as fat people during the pandemic. I'm just going to say a couple of words about NAFA before I introduce you to our two very special guests today, Deshaun Harrison and Reagan Chastain. Um, for those of you who are new to NAFA, we are the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance. Uh, we were incorporated in 1969, so we are celebrating our 52nd birthday this year, as um, which makes us the world's largest organized and documented um, group representing fat people's rights. We do that through advocacy, education, and support for fat folks, um, primarily focusing our work in the United States where we are, um, where we're founded, but also um, hopefully supporting and understanding and championing that work all over the world. Our uh, webinar series um, is one of our greatest education tools where we invite people from FAT community to share their expertise and lived experience, uh, which is of course another kind of expertise, uh, their academic or lived experience ex expertise or any kind of expertise they have on a variety of topics relating to FAT life and supporting FAT people. We are able to do that through the generous contributions of NAFA members and other supporters. If you would like to support us in continuing to do such programming, you can find information about giving to NAFA at nafa.org, N-A-A-F-A dot O-R-G. Just click on the Join Give tab and you can find information about supporting our webinar series, our community grants program, which gives small grants to people in fact community who would like to start new projects and which is in its fourth quarter of accepting applications right now through April 30th, 2021. And um, our Fat Community Voices blog, which features stories about a wide variety of aspects of fat history and fat life and all the other things we do. NAFA.org, you can also find us on um, your favorite social media sites. On most of them, we are NAFA official. Um, and uh, on Facebook, we are facebook.com slash equality at every size, which is the goal that we are working towards. I wanna thank you all for being with us today. And we're gonna get started with today's webinar, which is um, Diet Culture and Fat Shaming in the Age of Coronavirus, featuring Deshaun Harrison and Reagan Chastain. And hopefully these two are folks that you are already familiar with, but let me tell you a little bit about them and then you can get to know them a little bit more over this next hour. Deshaun Harrison, they, them, is a Black trans writer, abolitionist, and community organizer in Atlanta, Georgia. Harrison currently serves as the managing editor of Wear Your Voice magazine and is the author of the soon-to-be-published Belly of the Beast, The Politics of Anti-Fatness as Anti-Blackness. Harrison is also a public speaker who often leads workshops on Blackness, queerness, gender, fatness, disabilities, and the intersection at which they all meet. Their portfolio and other work can be found on their website, DeshaunHarrison.com, D-A-S-H-A-U-N-H-A-R-R-I-S-O-N.com, on Twitter at DeshaunLH, and on Instagram at DeshaunLH. We'll put that information in the chat for those of you who are with us live and in the captions for those of you who are watching later on YouTube. Welcome, Deshaun. I would also like to introduce y'all to Reagan Chastain, she, her, who is a speaker, writer, fat lead, certified health coach and functional training specialist and thought leader in the fields of body image, fat liberation, weight stigma and health at every size with specific focuses on weight stigma in healthcare, fitness and eating disorders. Reagan has brought her signature mix of humor and hard facts to diverse college, conference, and corporate stages, from Dartmouth to Caltech, to the Diabetes Education Specialist National Conference, to Google headquarters. Author of the popular blog, danceswithfat.org, since 2009. The book, Fat, The Owner's Manual. Editor of the anthology, The Politics of Size, and published in outlets from ESPNW to Glamour. Reagan is frequently featured as an expert in print, radio, television, and documentary film, including both PBS and the Olympic Channel. Reagan is a three-time national dance champion and a two-time marathoner who holds the Guinness World Record for heaviest woman to complete a marathon. 
Reagan lives in LA with her fiance, Julianne. Hi, Julianne. And their two adorable dogs, Cuddles Pick Me Up and Chad Channel Royale. Reagan, you let me know if I got that right. Um, find more information about her speaking at www.sizedforsuccess.com. Find Reagan on Twitter at Dances with Fat and on Instagram, Reagan Chastain. Reagan and Deshaun, welcome to the NAFA webinar series. Thank you so much for being with us today. Yay! I feel like we need an applause track for moments. <laughs> um, so I want to start by asking the two of you to tell me a little bit about when you first became aware of the coronavirus and COVID-19, and then when you started to think about what that meant to yourself as a fat person and what it meant to fat community as a whole. Deshaun, let's start with you. Yeah. Um, so I became aware of COVID-19, which as you know, was originally called coronavirus. Um, towards the beginning of last year was in, I think, um, perhaps the, the latter part of February, the beginning of March, some, somewhere around that time. Um, and I started to think almost immediately about what it would look like for me as a fat black person, um, particularly because, you know, the, the initial hysteria around the initial shock around like this, this virus was like, it's killing everyone. It, it all, it felt like it was, you know, like, like a plague that like, that we were living amongst, um, or living through. And, and so I thought, I know what my experience has been like in the medical industry, right? I know what the medical industry is. I know um, how the medical industry engages people who who look like me, who um, who show up with bodies like mine, um, with with skin like mine, right? And so, and and also, I'm also a fat person who has disabilities, right? And I'm also a fat person who is trans, and all these things. And so, <clears throat> my like my general concern for what it would look like to be navigating this um, came almost immediately for, and, and my friends will tell you, um, from the moment that we initiated lockdown last year, up until about maybe a week ago, <laughs> I did not leave my home, right? Like my, and I didn't really have folks over at my home either, because I, I, I knew and I know that the way that I would be engaged and that I, and that I will be engaged around this virus, um, should I ever have to be in in the in the hospital, right? Would look vastly different from a lot of what my friends look like, um, and so it was it was of the utmost importance for me, and is still of the utmost importance for me um, that I am like continuously watching uh, and doing what I can do to make sure that I don't that I don't like contract this virus because. Um, I know how so little care um, is put into caring for fat black folks. So that was that was like my initial thought around this virus. And of course, as I'm sure we'll talk about th throughout this talk, um, as time has gone on, that that initial um, thought has only festered and grown because of how fat folks have been engaged throughout this last year. Yeah, absolutely. Reagan, what about you? When did you first start to think about it for yourself in a fat body and then for fat community? Yeah, I had first started hearing about it through folks I work with in disability community in like January, late January, early February. Um, and I was concerned on a personal level, I'm fat, my partner is super fat and she has respiratory issues, um, all of which I'm totally authorized to, to share and talk about just to be clear. Um, and so realizing, you know, the kind of stigma that, she often faces in healthcare, we knew that it was really important um, to stay as safe as we could because there's no guarantee um, when it comes to super fat folks, you know, being able to get medical care, especially knowing that, you know, if it got as bad as people were predicting it would in the early days that we were headed for rationing protocols and we were headed for shortages um, and that often uh, weight is used um, and disability is used within that as a category and really, inappropriate and gross ways. Uh, so from a personal standpoint, we had the 
were lucky and privileged enough to be able to lock down in our home. And so that is what we did uh, starting in March. And um, until we got vaccinated, we continued to be fully locked down except for critical medical and vet appointments for the year. In terms of as an activist, I, I braced pretty early for the terrible press that I assumed was coming and the ways that it would be reported around fat bodies as a risk factor, around fat bodies in their medical treatment, around fat bodies being blamed. And unfortunately, I was right about a lot of that. I wish I had been wrong. And so that was, I knew that I was going to be, you know, going through studies and going through media as an activist and trying to do my part from home to help things be clear. Be clear. Uh, and that was, you know, the role that I hope to be able to take on. Um, I just, before we go on, I, I want to go back to what you just said about the terrible media that you knew was coming. <laughs> um, before we do that, I just want to make a trigger warning that I meant to make at the top of the hour. Um, first of all, because we are talking about the coronavirus pandemic, um, and we know that that has killed millions of people all over the globe, um, I just want to remind people that we will be talking about mortality issues, we will be talking about um, some memories and experiences that might be really painful around medical discrimination. So I just want people to be aware of that and be prepared for that. Um, I also want to say that both Reagan and Dishon are committed to not using what we in activist circles often refer to as the O words, overweight and obesity. But I know that some of you may um, be thinking about those words in terms of how the media has covered this. Um, so I just want, I want you to not be surprised if they avoid those words. Um, they're, we consider them, uh, well, actually, let me ask the two of you to put that in your own words. Before we move on with talking about this, can you explain why we don't use those words and why it's problematic that the media does use them so often? Reagan, will you start with this one? Uh, yeah, uh, so I don't use the words because they were literally created to medicalize and pathologize fat bodies um, from a racist basis. And so they aren't appropriate terms. They aren't terms that are helpful in any way. They can only serve to stigmatize and pathologize. And so I use other terms. What terms do you usually use instead? Uh, for myself and in general, I use fat. I also tend to use larger bodied, heavier bodied people of size. If there's a situation like, for example, an eating disorders community, often fat will be a triggering term to the people who I'm speaking to. And so I'll use alternatives in that at that time. Thank you. Deshaun, can you add to that other thoughts about um, avoiding that terminology and alternative terminology to use? Yeah. Um, similarly to, to Reagan, I... Um, I have long not used those terms because I do consider them to be slurs, um, particularly because they, they, like Reagan just said, were literally created um, more specifically in response to black fat folks, right? Like, um, you know, through, through, the, through the creation of the BMI scale um, and things of that nature. And so um, I don't use those terms because I don't, I have a, a specific commitment to divesting from anti-blackness, but also because um, I think that, you know, I, I'm not of the belief that there is a, a singular weight size that everyone of the human population is supposed to, to meet, right, uh, for one to be under or overweight. Um, and so I, I never used that language with, with um, unless I'm talking specifically about the words and why they're harmful. Um, and then in terms of like, <laughs> I was going to say in terms of alternatives, I only really use fat. Um, and sometimes I will also use larger um, or, or heavier too. But for the most part, I use fat unless a person I'm speaking to specifically suggests that I use something else. Um, but otherwise, I'm always using that term. Thank you both. And this, um, for the record, if it's not obvious from our name, the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance, um, we do fully embrace the use of the word fat here in our NAFA webinars. Um, thank you, Reagan, for raising that awareness that the way that it can be triggering for people in some ways. And we do want to be aware of that. So we just, um, I'll just issue that as a trigger warning as well, that like, we will be using the word fat throughout the rest of this. Um, anytime, I, I am still working on um, uh, removing the O word from my um, from from my vocabulary, I usually um, 
I don't use them in regular speech, but in quoting things that they're used in, I haven't learned to asterisk them out or remove them. So, um, so if I, you know, if I read something to you from a study or something like that, I may not skip those words, but audience, you can assume that I'm using those words in quotation marks, the so-called obesity epidemic, so-called overweight, as in over whose weight. Um, so, okay, so we can go on from there. So let's talk about that because part of what has been traumatic for fat people during this pandemic is the uptick in what was already a plethora of using those words all over the media. And then uh, because of the way they're tied to health and healthism, um, that just got used like in excessive over ev over everything, all the all the most, doing the most in all the ways in the you know in the last year or so. What is what's the effect of that? How does that uptick affect us as a community? Deshaun? Yeah, so I think um, so towards the beginning of, of this pandemic, I wrote an article about the CDC and its history in eugenics, right? Um, and so a lot of folks in fat spaces know this and, and many others do not, right? But like the, CD, the CDC played a very large role in this, this creation of the modern day obesity epidemic, right? You know, they, they, they and their lead scientists along with other folks published in a very national, very large um, journal, right? That fat folks were, were dying at these alarming rates, right? Um, that that four, over 400,000 fat folks are dying in one year due to obesity and that obesity, quote unquote, again, quote unquote, is, is surpassing, right? Or, or is, is becoming the, the number one killer over tobacco use. Um, and then of course, you know, a year later they retract that, that statement, they, they changed their numbers. Um, but by that time, you, media had taken off. Everything had already gone off of this initial um, study. And so when I, when I first heard about this virus, coronavirus, and like Reagan, I was like, you know, I know, I, I'm certain that what will come from this is, is more of the same, right? More of the exact same experiences that we've, that we've been through already um, and a worsening in, in so many ways of, um, of this like quote unquote obesity epidemic. Um, and that's exactly what happened, right? So now we're, we're having to live through this moment where um, continuously on a loop, right? Where there's headlines after headlines after headlines about what fatness is doing to coronavirus and not what, what coronavirus is doing to, to people who may also be fat, right? Um, and we're having to like witness what it looks like for, for like for the media and for the government to, to, to offer so much funding to these, these science organizations or these organizations based in science, um, most often referred to as eugenics, um, to, to try to like bring about this, um, some scientific backing that, that, that supports this idea that fat folks are, are the ones who are, who are the harmful ones in the midst of a pandemic and not that this virus that's, that's killing millions of people around the world, right? It's actually what's causing the harm. Um, and and I have, I've been talking about this for, for the last year, of course. And last year I was in um, another like Zoom conference type of thing um, with some folks who were talking about coronavirus and what it would look like for those of us who are like, who are living through it. But um, what, I, what I realized and what I'm still thinking about today is, the effects of, of this moment 10 years from now, right? Like it, it took us this, this moment from 2004 to 2006 for someone to even write about or, or in large part to write about what this CDC report initially did to fat folks around the US. And so my concern is like, what does it look like for the next five to 10 years? Um, how, how will this play a role in, in how policy is written around fat folks moving forward, right? And, and how the medical industry is, is further, um, uh, is, is given more funding, right? Is, is further funded to be able to support um, these ideas that, that fat folks are 
or that our bodies rather, right? That our, that our bodies are the, the things that are causing us to die and not the other issues that, that play a role in how we are even marginalized in the first place. Um, and, I, and I'm thinking more specifically about what that looks like for, for fat black folks who are navigating the, 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 the crux of this violent medical industry because we are moving through this anti-fatness as anti-blackness um, that, that, that shows up in a very compounded way that forces us then to be hyper removed from from care or to exist in this in this precarious space right where we're having to 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 take care of ourselves in very particular ways because we know that that the ER won't right or we know that doctors won't or we know that so much about how how we're engaged um is always already put in conversation with disability and with fatness and and with and with blackness and because of that removes us so much from care so i think like right now we're witnessing um, like a, 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 a the setup to what will come from from this type of violent moment that pushes us or, or propels us into a, a very violent next couple of years um, that to me I don't see not reproducing the very same violence as we saw in 2004. Well and Reagan I know that you have um, some particular history around really examining research I think it's actually part of your story of how you became an activists that you were doing a lot of in-depth examination of research about weight and weight loss. And so I know that you have a particular skill set around taking that research apart. Would you talk about that a little bit and just a little bit? We are going to go a little deeper into that subject with Dr. Kat Pazé next week's webinar, but I still would like today's audience to hear a little bit of that from you with your particular um, experience at looking at research that way. Because I think Deshaun is right, like the research that's happening now, even as it gets debunked, debunked if it doesn't get uh, debunked. I made that up for you, Deshaun. Um, even as it gets debunked, if it doesn't, if that is not popularized in the same way that the original research is, it doesn't help us a lot. So can you comment on that a little bit, Reagan? Sure. And it's a huge issue because we have this, uh, what has come from that, that beginning with the CDC is the idea that if fat bodies experience something more than thin bodies, then fat bodies are the cause of that experience, which ignores all kinds of inequalities that exist and including intersectional um, inequalities for people who are fat and part of other marginalized identities. And so I think a good example of this is that in 2009, uh, during the H1N1 outbreak, fat people were getting sick or having more severe outcomes. And so all the hypothesizing happened. Oh, it's because of widespread inflammation. Oh, it's because they have more receptor sites. Let's figure, let's all hypothesize what's wrong with fat bodies. So Sun et al, after the uh, outbreak did a, a retrospective study and found that the entire difference could be explained in that thin people got treatment sooner than fat people did. That was the difference in outcomes. Wow. Right? And so I was yeah. knowing that I was like, you know, <laughs> in my naive, hopeful brain that still exists somewhere back there was like, maybe we'll learn from that, right? Announcer's voice, but they would not learn from that. And so here comes this, you know, the first thing, you know, oh, oh, people who are, you know, quote unquote obese are dying at higher rates because in New Orleans, 25% of the deaths are people in that category. So I do a quick search. In New Orleans, more than 38% of people are in the quote unquote obese category. So if 38% of a population, if a, some, if a group is 38% of a population, but only 25% of the deaths, that would show that group to be in a protected class. That's the only thing. So like, this is the level of terrible research. And my background, luck and privilege is that I studied research methods and statistics in school. And I cannot clearly enough state how hard I would have failed if I turned in research like what gets published and reported on. It's shockingly bad. It's not even, you don't even have to like dig into the tables or be doing calculations by hand. Like it's shockingly poor what gets reported. And so you see that a lot. Another a more recent example, you know, a headline said Pfizer vaccine not as effective for fat people. And I was like, what now? And people, you know, I saw people posting it and really concerned because we're already getting vaccinated. So I look at yeah, it. Yeah, people it, were uh, really freaked out about that headline, really. Yeah, and justifiably so. Absolutely. You know, and so, because again, we know we're not going to get as good treatment if we do get sick. Like this is a compounding problem. So I look at the study. First of all, it looked at an antibody that may or may not actually confer immunity. They're not even sure. 
And it found that fat people produce less of that antibody than thin people do. But additionally, uh, older people produce less than younger people and cis men produce less than cis women. And unfortunately, as per usual, no trans or non-binary representation in this study right, a constant problem and an underrepresentation of people of color in this study, constant issue with research. But the report just said fat people not covered, right, doesn't mention that three large groups produce less of an antibody that may or may not have anything to do with immunity, right, so it's a combination of poor research and then a lack of journalistic ethics or a lack of scientific literature or a combination of those, a desire for the clicks that fat phobia always brings. But it's something that we've seen from the beginning to now is just horrible science. And then here comes horrible fat phobic reporting to help it out and get it out there. And then here comes horrible layperson understanding, which is not lay people's fault because we don't all know how to do this kind of research analysis, um, but because we do all live with so deeply entrenched diet culture in our lives and so regular of a message of um, fat plus health equals you're dying, um, then it was like, it's like the, the, um, the perfect environment had already been created for those kinds of studies and those kinds of headlines to multiply, right? So what about that diet culture piece? Um, because one of the things I wanted to get perspective from the two of you on is like we we know the ways that well I hope we know and now we know a little bit better from what you've already said some of the ways that we need to be on guard for the medical discrimination and the ways that you know access to care and later to vaccines are an issue for us but what about in our day-to-day -day lives like how does this fat phobia affect us with you know the people around us in our communities and our loved ones as people start to as people who are not fat or even other fat people start to be really concerned about these faulty headlines but believing them then what happens to us um reagan will you pick it up again and then we'll pass it to Deshaun? yeah i think so part of it is we internalize it right we're told if we're fat it's our fault if we're fat it's a bad thing and now so everything bad that's happening to fat people including us is our fault and then the media takes it a step further and says well it's every you know now you're hurting everyone right because of because of your fatness and how it's affected by COVID. And so we get that impact of not just internalizing it, but then also being blamed by others. Have, and our friends and family members are hearing these same messages, whether they're fat or thin. Our healthcare practitioners, everyone that we might interact with are hearing these messages. And so there's that. And then I would add another layer of all the jokes, all the fat phobic jokes. Oh, the quarantine 15. Oh, you know, we're in the middle of a deadly global pandemic, but the worst thing possible is that somebody might look a little bit more like me when they come out of it. You know, this constant, like dealing with this through fat phobia, through just casual fat phobia, which also I think has a pretty severe impact. Yeah, absolutely. Deshaun, do you have thoughts to add to that about the sort of um, the cultural impact and the personal impact of, of being exposed to all that negative media? I think that that is exactly it, right? And I, and I think that, um, yeah, so often people like to move us away from conversations around the cultural impact just so we can have conversations about like what, what the medical side of things look like, but the cultural impact um, matters so greatly in how you even have to interact with the medical side of things, right? Yes, yes. This type of internalization of, of, of these violent jokes and, um, and this like recreation of, of what folks will and will not allow into their homes, right? Like regarding food and, and at the beginning of, of the pandemic, like Reagan mentioned earlier, um, you know, like when, we, when we're thinking about what we have to ration right now, we're thinking about what's best to buy, what's going to last longer, but also what's going to be quote unquote healthy. Um, and as we're moving through all of that, right, this is exactly how we birth eating disorders, right? This is exactly how we like, we create an environment where people are now having to think very heavily about what their body looks like or, or how they should interact with their body or, or whether or not their body is going to, to be well enough to, to survive a pandemic. Um, and things of that nature, right? Which, which not only then, like I said, births gives birth to this, um, these eating disorders, but also or disordered eating as well. But it also gives birth to, or rather, 
it heightens this ableist like idea that we have around bodies, right? Where our bodies have to present a particular way, they have to show up a particular way always. Um, and if they don't, then we are then then we have to always be like committed to to curing them or committed to to making them better, and not rather like sitting with the fact that our bodies are showing up in the way that they are, um, and and that's just what they what they are and what they do. Uh, and so I think that the impact of this will in so many ways like, not just be like a political or, or, or a medical impact, but it absolutely will be um, a cultural one as well. Um, and I think the cultural impact of this is going to be one that, that, that outlives this singular moment um, in, so, in so many ways that, that really does reproduce a lot of the same violence as we were just talking about through 2004 and 2009 and and things that, again that we have we've seen over and over and over again um and yet that's the the brilliance and the brilliance the brilliance of and this unimaginative nature of white supremacy and anti-blackness is that it doesn't have to reproduce any or it doesn't have to produce a, a new way of, of doing the very same thing because culture reproduces the very same idea that leads us to all of this. Um, and, and I think that that's something that has to be named always is that white supremacy doesn't have to be brilliant or rather doesn't have to be imaginative because um, the work is already done. It's already been, been planted and all that has to happen then is that you fund the science that allows you to back that up. And then you don't give people access to actually being able to do good research. So they don't know what they're reading or why they're reading it right. Then you fund the media to make sure the media pushes this narrative around how, how fat folks are, are the cause of these things. And now we have have a greater issue that that reproduces itself over and over and over again um, and so I think that is going to be the the impact of this culturally so what would you say to that person who is not part of fat activist community or had does not have a politicized framework about fat about race about these other areas that are um, that are being you know impacted both medically and culturally in this way and with somebody who's just like you know like they don't know any of this stuff yet. They're they're right at the beginning of this yeah, this yeah. journey of learning this stuff, and they just don't want to have to buy new clothes because times are tight and it's hard to find bigger clothes. And I don't have a lot of money to invest if I gain twenty pounds. So don't I have a right to be stressed out and worried about this? Like, what would you say to that person? <laughs> well, I think that would completely depend on the person's intentions because I do know that there are, you know, are a lot of people who who will offer those things with horrible intentions. But I also know that that there are people who will offer those things um, and, and they mean well, right? You know, like they really are like, you know, like you said, I don't have the money to buy a, new, a whole new wardrobe and and I don't I don't know what it looks like to go in the store and like all these different things that people will try to offer you, right? And I think my response to that generally is, you know, to sit like, well, let's sit down and, and really talk through what it, what it looks like to navigate this, right? If you if you are concerned about gaining weight because you can't buy new clothes, um, I recognize that as a very as a very real thing to be navigating, right? I'm someone who who has come from houselessness, someone who has come from unemployment, someone who has has had to navigate not being able to buy new clothes. I get that. And also your body changes regardless, right? And so what is so so now we have to sit with what it means to to try to try to find this this room to be okay with what our body is looking like first because the more we stress about not wanting our body to look like something else and our body continues to change the worst things become for us around the stress around our bodies right so now you're having to deal with more than just buying new clothes now you have stacked up medical bills because you had to go to the er because you were stressing out about a, a new body that that you don't have to stress out about right um and, and i think that so much about that is how we have to have to move through these type of conversations because yeah things can be really difficult to, and also you don't have to and i'm saying this to someone who has who has been there you don't have to go to the 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 mall or the outlet to buy new clothes and oftentimes as a fat person especially for those who are like mid to super fat like a lot of us are right you won't find those clothes in the mall anyway so so what does it look like to to you know try to find um or engage other fat folks or, or, or places 
created around like to really benefit fat people like with fat clothing that really looks out for you while you're also navigating this moment of of, of impoverishment right um and things like that i just think i think we have to be very particular about how we interact with people to make clear that one moment is not just one moment it builds and, and becomes another moment which becomes another moment um and if we are if we're so focused on not wanting to be fat right or not wanting to become fatter that we put an extra strain on our own bodies to, um, to avoid that then, right? Especially in the middle of a pandemic, we only create worse situations for ourselves and not better ones. Um, and I think that that's how we have to navigate that. And then of course, by by that you introduce, or at least to me by that, I, I introduce like, you know, the, the fat politic because I think that it does matter and it does shift how you even think about buying new clothes. I don't know if that's true for, for you two, but for me, like when I, developed the fat politic, I had a better understanding of what it even meant to buy clothes, right? Um, because I was less concerned about wishing that I was smaller so I could fit clothes that I liked or whatever, and was more concerned than with like figuring out what it looked like to, to make sure that I could get clothes that I liked, how looking in more specific places to try to find clothes that I could afford and also that I liked, um, but also like not being so stressed out about losing the weight that I'm so hyper focused on smaller clothes that I can't fit, won't ever be able to fit, and looking for something more like more specific. So I think that's the route that I would go. Okay, thank you. And um, Reagan, so I want to ask you a slightly different version, but a question sort of in the si a similar vein. Um, what do I do if I have a thin friend on social media who is bragging about how proud they are that they didn't gain the COVID fifteen? It. I think it depends on the friend and how close you are. Uh, you might say something global, like I wish that we could just affirm bodies of all sizes instead of, you know, feeling like controlling our bodies in some way is an achievement. Like, you know, it causes eating disorders and weight stigma and kind of explain it that way. You might have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with this person. You know, I hear what you're saying and I understand that we live in a culture that tells you that like, that's a good thing. But in fact, when you say that you're hurting people, including me and here's how. You're hurting people and you know just try to make it clear the impact of that statement and you know then perhaps open the door to having a larger conversation about fat oppression about the ways that that person can work in solidarity about the ways that they can you know not harm with how they're talking provide them with resources you know and again it depends on the friend and if they're like oh i had no idea and i'd love to learn more about this and if you're in a place where you feel like you want to educate them then take that opportunity um if if not i always want people to know like you deserve to set boundaries and whether that means you know i you're just not somebody I can have in my life or, you know, I want you in my life, but I need, we're not going to talk about this or, you know, I'm going to unfriend you on Facebook. You get to navigate that, but you get to navigate that and you deserve to set the terms. So you may, you can't control other people's behavior, but you deserve to set boundaries for yourself to keep yourself safe and to surround yourself with people who are treating you with the respect you deserve. Thank you. So um, I'm going to ask one more question to our guests and I want to start taking some questions from the chat. So if you've got a question in mind, you can go ahead and um, go ahead and post that in the chat and we'll um, get to a few of your questions. While y'all are queuing up your questions, I'll ask one more. Um, let's talk about the diet industry and how they have played on those fears or attitudes about um, about fat and the coronavirus over the last year. Um, Deshaun, what do you think about that? Do you have you noticed a, a change in the way the diet industry is presenting itself to the world in the pandemic in, era? Um, yes, yeah, so I think that I think the interesting thing about the diet industry is the way that it shape shifts and how it um, advertises itself, right? So you know, in the in the two thousands, um, so much about it was. Jenny Craig and Weight Watchers and and all these like these these things that folks wanted like um, to offer to people that made them feel like they were a part of this like exclusive club um, that was going to make them just become the thinnest person in the world um, and and would then like be better and in, in, in their health and in their size and I think in the in the middle of this pandemic what has been interesting to watch is is the way that 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 the diet industry, that diet culture like really has 
has, has shifted um, away from, from this commercialized form of, or, or I guess commercialized type of um, advertisement, right? To this very, uh, a lot more straightforward, it seems, a, a very like straightforward approach to, to why you just simply should not be fat, right? Like where, where there's, there's, it's like in your face, on, on social media. So it's, it can't be avoided. You can't just flip the channel. You can't just like move away from things. It's, it's, it's so in your face now, I think through this pandemic that I've noticed. Um, and and particularly the way that diet culture has has worked so, so closely with gym culture, right? Um, so many things closed down throughout the pandemic, except for gyms. Gyms have been wide open for the most part, and and even if they shut down from twenty four hours to to twelve, they they've been very open, um, and people have had the option to go in and 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 wear their mask or not wear their mask, right? They've been allowed to to go in the gym, and you're sharing the space, you're sharing showers, you're sharing um, equipment, all these things with with other people who you do not know, who you don't interact with, who are there for hours, and the workers they clean, but they can't clean everything all the time, always, right? And so it's like this this commitment to what I've noticed throughout this pandemic is this commitment, this overwhelming commitment um, to to holding on to or trying to find this very um, structured body, this very ideal body um, in a way that that doesn't care if you put yourself at, at risk of contracting this virus or put others at risk of, of contracting the virus through yourself, right? Um, that, that That's not met with the same level of vitriol that fatness is by simply existing in the world. Um, and, and, and I think that that is like how we, how I've really witnessed this, this diet culture, this gym culture in the last year is that so much about, about people's engagement with, with the virus has only affirmed and reaffirmed and confirmed that, that folks are not really invested at all in, in health or, or in, in embodiment or in, in, in any, anything that actually that they push on us. What they're concerned with most is policing fatness and, and in a lot of ways, killing fatness. I always tell people that I think people, the bottom line of, of, of diet culture is to kill fat people. And I know that feels very morbid. It feels very, very hard, like a hard pill to swallow, but that's the reality. And either they do it through through our literal deaths or they do it through trying to remove the fatness from our bodies. We don't have an option in that, right? The only the only option that diet culture gives you is, is to kill your fatness. Um, and, and I think that that is just what, I, what I'm continuously witnessing in this last year um, and, and what seems to be like reimagined over and over again through this pandemic. One of my favorite things you mentioned, Jim's being open, and I say favorite um, sarcastically, I, I'm in the greater Phoenix area in Arizona. And when things began to shut down last March, they left the golf courses, coast, golf, um, courses open. And the argument was that people needed them for mental health and for exercise. And I'm like, but y'all are closed in public parks, but you're leaving these golf courses open, which are only accessible to people of a certain, you know, a certain class status, which are primarily populated by people of certain racial groups, especially here in Arizona, but historically through in golf, right? And and which are then staffed by people who are of more disadvantaged groups, economically and racially, social socioculturally, and who then can't qualify for government assistance for having, you know, um, income challenges because they didn't lose their jobs because the golf course stayed open because it was so essential. And it was just like this, um, it, it, like terrible, um, you know, like diamond example of like the perfect way in which um, like, there's absolutely no intersectionality in looking at how this choice to let these people have their exercise in the way they want to is uh, like has all of these ripple effects, you know, in the kinds of ways that you're talking about. Like, it's fine if we expose these other people, we wanna golf, you know, and we need this for our exercise and therefore that made it okay. 
it was just really, it was just really interesting. I know that's a super specific example locally, but um, it was just really interesting to, to see that play out and to see the lack of critical response to it. That was just like, oh, okay, right, exercise. Everybody needs to exercise, you know? Okay, well, what about these kids whose only access to exercise is through their schools, which are closed, you know? Or like, you know, who can't exercise in their own neighborhoods or don't have parks or whatever, like all of those things were just not on anyone's radar at all, as long as everybody got to keep golfing. Um, it was really interesting in a tragic way. Um, um, Reagan, I'm going to give the, the next question to you. Um, thank you both. I'm going to have Reagan start this one. Thank you both for your knowledge and stories. I'm a medical student and I've begun research on EDs, eating disorders. I hate the language that's used when discussing alleged crim uh, cr clinical correlations to fat folks. We're working to change this in our curriculum, but what can future doctors do to improve care for fat people and combat anti-fatness in medicine? Um, and you can talk about that specifically related to the question of eating disorders that was brought up or in, you know, it also obviously applies to our overall healthcare and how we survive this ongoing pandemic. Reagan, will you start that one? Sure. From, from a meta place, it's about making sure healthcare access should be about taking care of the bodies that exist with tools and best practices that, that were created for those bodies. So instead of saying, we're going to create tools and pharmaceuticals and best practices for thin people, then we're going to try to make fat people thin and hope that that works the same for them. We say, these are the types of people who exist in the world. Right. And this doesn't just work for fatness. It works for, uh, you know, any number of marginalizations that it's important to say these are the types of people who exist in the world and we're going to create health care to support those people, as opposed to saying we're going to try to make everyone, you know, this certain type of person. So that from a meta standpoint in general, I think one of the things that's really difficult is that medical school is, you know, obviously, phenomenally difficult. There's a huge amount of information to be garnered and it's being supported by this terrible research, you know, that is funded cyclically exactly as Dejan explained earlier. And so people don't have time to question that. And so in any of the ways that you can start asking questions, is there a single study that shows that a majority of the subjects had significant long-term weight loss? Does that study exist? Because it doesn't right? Start asking questions and start asking, you know, how does, how can we help people where they are? How can we help to support people's health based on their prioritization, based on their path, rather than trying to manipulate weight as the primary uh, way to, to try to achieve quote unquote health. Thank you, Deshaun. Your thoughts on that? Things we can do to help medical students create a more, um, more just medical system for fat bodies. No, I don't think I have much more to add, but like, I think Reagan just covered it. I, I think all I would just reiterate really is, is to ask the questions, right? Like uh, so many, so many of the students, um, they, and this, this really applies across, across the spectrum, not just in med school. So many students, they sit in classes led by professors who, who they therefore take up as an authority figure and don't ask any questions because someone of authority is speaking to them. Um, but it's important in, in, in the medical industry to really be asking the questions because if you don't ask those questions, right, you, you will only then believe what's being taught to you. Um, you only then, then spew what's been taught to you, right? Even if you haven't done the research for yourself or even if you haven't read the research for yourself. Um, and so I think that it is very important to ask those questions, but also there will be some research that supports what they're saying. Right. I think we have to acknowledge the fact that that facts are not foolproof. Right. That that there that there's no such that rather that this binary of, of facts versus mistruths or facts versus lies is actually just as harmful, I think, as 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 any other binary. Right. Because there are some 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 facts, some some things that will be backed up by research. And also you have to ask the question of who conducted this research who was part of this research, right? Who, how many people were considered in this research? How diverse was this research, right? And also, why do I have to believe this research over this research, right? Because there also, there will probably be research that doesn't support 
that that claim as much as there will be research that supports the claim. And so it's important, I think, to, to really ask those questions and, and dig really deep in, in doing so, um, so that you're not just going with the flow of, of what's being offered, but that you are being considerate of, um, of the ways that that the medical industry has been violent towards fat people, especially those of us who sit at varying um, marginalized identities. Um, and I think that that would be all I have to add to Reagan's point. Well, and if I can just add something to that too, I think that piece about, you know, we were talking earlier about the diet industry, like so many people don't stop and look at how much research in that we just consider neutral medical research is funded by the diet industry specifically. It's not just influenced by diet culture in the way that it pervades the world around us. It's literally funded by the diet industry. And so one of the reasons we sometimes see more research um, that proves how bad fat is than research that proves that that's not true is that there's more incentive for people to prove that fat is bad so that they can monetize ways to cure fatness, right? So I think that's an important piece of it too. Um, um, I want to share a comment from Sam in the chat back to what we were talking about, about people engaging in things that are not necessarily health related, but calling that health during this pandemic. Um, Sam says, someone I know did a bikini competition during COVID-19 where no one wore masks at the competition and then claimed she was doing it for her health. Um, <laughs> I what would you say to somebody that you knew who was doing like, is there something different you would say than the things that you've already said? Um, Deshaun, let's start with you. I don't talk to those people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I just have to be very clear about that because I think <laughs> that, that <laughs> it would make my blood pressure go up um, because it really only, <laughs> I think that, that that would just, I would look at them and say, and that is precisely why we know that health as a word is only supposed to be about disabled people and fat people. And it is not supposed to be about anything else, right? Nothing else matters so long as you are thin and able-bodied. Um, and, and, and I think that is exactly the proof of that, right? That's, that, that's exactly what leads people to this. Um, and that's why people can sit in a gym where there's sweat everywhere and people who not who aren't aren't wearing masks and 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 things that may not may or may not be clean and they can shower in in the shower with no shoes on and things like that and not feel like they're putting themselves at risk of of contracting coronavirus because what matters is that they are at least combating fatness um, and and that has to be enough because if they can combat fatness and then everything else about their life is fine. If I'm not fat, I can at least survive COVID, right? Even though we know that that's not true, right? Over 500,000 Americans that that were killed by this virus were not all fat. <laughs> like we know that that's true, and yet and still, what is the belief is that well, as long as I'm not fat, I can I can survive anything. Um, and and some studies will show you that the opposite is true. Um, and so I think that right. you know, <laughs> I think that I, I just I don't talk to those people. I'm grateful to not have to be in space with, with those people. Um, that my friends are are considerate enough to think about those type of things that even if they believe it to be true, which I don't think my friends do, but even if they believe that, they would never say it to me because they know that I would scold them and probably do worse things. So so I don't I don't have those type of conversations. Reagan, did you want to add anything about the bikini competition for health? It's just like, look, health is an amorphous concept. It's hard to pin down when you start to try. Health is not an obligation. It's not a barometer of worthiness. It's not entirely within our control. And it's not a bikini contest with no masks during COVID. That I know for sure. There's a lot of stuff I don't know that I do. So like my, what I would say to that person is like, I'm not sure how you ended up in my life, but that's over now um, because I just can't share space and time and energy with somebody who will behave like that. Like, I can't imagine what you were thinking, but it's not okay. Thank you. Um, we're going to just do, uh, there are two more questions I'm going to take that are already in the chat, and then we're going to go ahead and wrap up out of respect for folks' time. Um, I will let everybody know that if you have um, additional questions on the subject of fat and COVID that we don't get to today, you can email them to me at chair at nafa.org, and I will try to work them into one of the upcoming COVID um, webinars or into some other uh, educational materials from, from NAFA in the future. Um, one of the questions was, I'm going to paraphrase it, 
um, how do you think that um, anti-fat reactions from doctors are being affected by the fact that people are seeing their doctors more often via telehealth visits instead of in person? And is there, are it, like, what adjustments do we need to make because of that? And what are the sort of pros and cons of being a fat person whose doctor doesn't weigh you and see your body? Um, Reagan, will you start? I've seen some good come out of that. And I know super fat people who were using that as a tool prior to COVID, that they would see doctors via telehealth and they would not have the video or they would have the video to where you couldn't really see their size. And so they were able to get more competent care because the doctor was able to actually focus on the health issue that they came to talk about rather than focusing on body size. So I imagine that could have been helpful through COVID for people who obviously um, didn't need to be seen in person. Uh, as, as kind of a tool to try to circumvent weight stigma. Thank you. Um, I'm looking for one more question and give me one second because my screen rolled and I lost it again. Um, actually, while we uh, while I hunt down that question, let me ask this other one. Um, someone in the chat has asked us to, um, to talk about what allies should be doing right now to support fat people. What advice do you have for, um, for folks who wanna show greater allyship? Uh, Reagan, we'll start with you and then Deshaun. Uh, speak out and speak out in ways that center the voices of people from the community you're working in solidarity with, in particular people at multiple marginalization. So where your voice has incredible resources that you can share and then be there to moderate the discussion afterwards. When you're working in solidarity, don't just post something about fat liberation and then like nope out for whatever happens in the comment section. That's your responsibility. You created that in your space, moderate that discussion, continue to educate, continue to center the voices of people who are doing the work. Deshaun, what about you? Yeah, um, I should start by naming that I don't believe in allies. Um, I, I don't believe that that is, um, or rather that term is not something that I subscribe to, um, particularly because um, for a long time, folks who call themselves allies in varying communities um, have been granted a lot of space um, to do absolutely nothing um, and say that they're doing something because they're in, they're sharing space with um, the folks of the marginalized community. Um, and so what I am always looking for is, um, I'm gonna to, to take a word from, from like um, racial spaces. I am looking for a body trader, right? Somebody who is, who is committed to, to betraying their commitment to, to thinness, right? Who is committed to showing up and, and, and going above and beyond, right? Um, and showing up for, for fat folks. So um, what does it look like to, what does it look like for you to uh, be a person who, like Reagan just offered, who is moderating conversations between you and other thin people consistently, right? To make sure that thin folks are, are, are learning about um, fat politics and not just from your own opinion, but like reading through texts, like reading through books, reading through articles, watching videos and having a facilitated conversation around what that looks like or what does it look like to, to <laughs> give money to organizations and to, and to fat people who are doing the work that you are not doing, right? To make sure that that work is sustainable. Um, I, I think ultimately like a, a person who is trying to show up for fat folks should be going above and beyond to advocate for fat folks in the medical industry, right? I, I, a lot of my, I've had them friends go with me to the ER when I've had to go. And while in there, right, I advocate for myself very well, but they will also show up for me in, in front of doctors to make sure that I'm not being sidelined or disrespected in front of a doctor, right? So showing up for your friends and in, in, at a doctor's appointment, right? If your friend has a doctor's appointment and they're fat, why not volunteer to go with them to make sure that they can be, um, that they're better taken care of, right? Or or doing things that that really, um, that really supports their, their need, I guess, um, while, while navigating fat phobia or anti-fatness and anti-blackness. I think that is really, really, really important to me. Um, and, and those are just a few suggestions that I have around what that would look like. 
Thank you. So before we wrap up, I just want to, before I ask you the sort of final closing question that I always ask, I just want to have both of you have a chance to tell us a little bit about what you're working on now, what you're doing in the world now. I know we mentioned Deshaun's book, which is coming out, um, Belly of the Beast, right? And, um, and we always like to ask our authors if there's some place that they want um, if they have a favorite bookstore or place they want to order from the publisher, uh, we know y'all all already know you can get things from Amazon. So we want to talk about the other independent places or, or direct purchases that you could do. Um, so um, Deshaun, let's start with you. We know you've got your book coming out. Tell us about what else you've got coming up. And also if that you have a preferred way that we get our hands on your book. Yes. Um, so I do have a book coming up. It'll be on shelves August 10th of this year. Um, it's called Belly of the Beast, The Politics of Anti-Fatness as Anti-Blackness. I'm very excited about this book. It's my first book ever. Um, and it was, it was a long time coming, but I'm excited to be able to put it out into the world. Um, I don't necessarily have like specific places that I have in mind for you to buy from. Um, I, of course, Amazon as a last res resort, um, is, is preferred, um, Pre-order is preferred. The more you pre-order, the more they prioritize the book, um, which helps the author. So I would love for, for folks to pre-order the book as they can. Um, you can go through Penguin Random House, which is a distributor that I'm publishing through. Um, they will either have it or you can go through uh, my publishing house, North Atlantic Books. They also have it. Um, that's when you're in the US, but outside of the US, you have to go to retailers that are specific to your country, right? So um, unfortunately, the only things that I know in my, off the top of my head are Amazon. So just take this with a grain of salt. But if you're in Canada, right, you'll go to amazon.ca. Or if you're in the UK, you go to amazon.uk instead of like going to um, the US Amazon um, link so that you can pre-order from there. Um, but wherever, wherever there are books available in your country um, that are not Amazon, you can go to um, and, and it should be available for pre-order, both the Kindle edition and um, the physical copy. And if you're with us right now, thank you to Christelle for posting the link um, to the publisher in the chat. We'll also add that to the captions of the video for those of you who are watching it on YouTube. Um, and is there anything besides your book that you wanna tell us about, Deshaun? No, I don't think so. Um, I, I, that's a pretty big project to have coming up. So is, no pressure to have it, something else. It's a very big project. Um, I think other than that, you know, um, please continue to support Warrior Voice magazine. Um, we are an independent digital feminist magazine um, and all, we're run and operated by black queer and trans folks. Um, and it, the work that we're doing, I think is really, really, really essential. Um, and, and because of that, it's not, it's not very supported um, in ways that, that helps sustain us. So please show up in that way. Um, and, and yeah, that's about it. I, I, other than that, Tigress, I know in the chat I was talking about, Christelle names that she wanted to be put on stack for something, I'm not really sure what, but um, just wanted to make sure that, that she had the space for that. But other than that, um, yeah, I, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Reagan, tell us what you're up to. Uh, let's see. Um, Dr. Louise Metz, Tiana Dotson, and I recently launched the Hayes Health Sheet Project um, with a grant from ASDA. So it's H A E S healthsheets.com. And they're diagnosis specific sheets that you can take to your healthcare practitioner that give um, the options for weight neutral, fat positive care, as well as like a resource bank and a page that explains why we don't recommend weight loss as a health intervention. Um, so I'm excited about that to have that in the world. Um, I've been doing since lockdown started, I've been doing monthly workshops at, online, and that's been fun. The the one for April is dealing with fat phobia at the doctor's office. And so all of my workshops have a pay what you can afford option. And then also uh, a video option if you can't make it live. So you can always find that in all of my social media at danceswithfat.org. And that's basically the, the center of my little tiny universe. 
thank you both for being here. Um, before we wrap up with our final question, I will just say that um, we always encourage our webinar guests to, um, and webinar viewers later, to directly support the people that we invite to our webinar. Um, we do compensate our webinar speakers for their time, even though um, in, in many ways, NAFA is a volunteer organization. We do compensate our webinar speakers for their time, but we also encourage you to support them directly with your, um, with your likes, your comments, and whenever possible with additional funding support. So we will provide that information in the caption on the YouTube video of how you can give directly to Deshaun and Reagan or to some projects of their choice. Um, if uh, And y'all are welcome to put that in the chat right now for the live people if you would like to. Um, so, and, and of course, once again, we are able to do these webinars and to offer so many of our NAFA resources to the general public for free because we have support from our members and supporters. Um, if that is something you would like to continue to support, once again, you can donate via nafa.org and just click on the join donate tab. Um, so our final question every time, um, I just wanna make sure that there's nothing that you really wish I had asked you <laughs> that I didn't ask you. Um, so, um, is there anything that we didn't talk about, um, either because I missed it from, from wise folks who asked it in the chat or because we didn't think of it, um, as we flowed through this topic, um, that you just really think needs to be highlighted that we, you know, that, that this webinar is not complete until we think about this thing. Um, Reagan, let's start with you. Just one thing I was thinking about when we were talking about, you know, not wanting to become fatter because of clothes or whatever is that weight stigma is real and it impacts fat people's lives in any number of ways and more so if they're part of more than one marginalized community. And so from my perspective, what I came to was that I had spent a lot of time fighting my body on behalf of weight stigma. And so I decided that instead I would fight weight stigma on behalf of my body. And that was the change that allowed me to really reconceptualize the world and get to a place of peace with my body, um, even in a world where weight stigma does have, you know, a number of negative impacts on me. Thank you. Deshaun, final thoughts from you? Yeah, no, I think that was great. Thank you, Reagan, for that. Um, I, don't, I don't have anything that I don't think that we um, didn't cover. Um, I am grateful to have been here. Um, and to have been a part. So thank you for having me. And um, I hope that folks out in the audience learned something from us. Um, and I'm excited to continue this conversation um, and excited for the next two parts. Wait, Deshaun. Yes, yes, Christelle. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, Christelle, do you that. need to ask every, something to everyone? Yes. Um... Reagan, hello, nice to meet you. I'm really blown away. You were very brilliant and I'm so glad to be introduced to you. And also hello to Deshaun. Um, the question that I wanted to ask, cause like, I didn't know how to consolidate succinctly. I don't want to take up too much time. I know folks want to go home, but if it was addressed, I didn't really um, think it was clear. I don't know, or what is the way that um, to debunk fat phobes on healthism when their way of understanding healthism is that it's biological and that science is a purity and that um sociology does not affect it and that's just innate within nature yeah i i like this question um i think that my response to this right is first of all this is something i write about in, in my book um but I don't believe um, health to be biological or, or, or anything else. Um, and in fact, I understand health to be something created as, um, or rather created in opposition to fatness, right? Created in opposition to, to disabilities. Um, and, and in that way, uh, my commitment to, to this type of conversation that then positions um, that then positions health in this very bioessentialist type of way, right? Is to think through the through think through the ways that health, this the language of health, um, is particularly prioritized, um, particularly prioritized in a way that 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 removes um, 
or rather that decontextualizes how how it directly affects black folks in particular black black fat folks more specifically right so so to that point i mean we know that the medical industry as it is was created through eugenics and eugenicist projects, right? That's how we even get to this, this naming of, of a very specific type of, 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 um, of quote unquote disabilities. Um, and I, I'm using quote unquote for that because they weren't actual disabilities, um, like dreptotomania or, or things like that, that were just named or as things to, to control the slave, right? We recognize that. And, and if we rec recognize that as its origin for, for, for the medical industry in the US, we have to then recognize the fact that, that the very basis, the very foundation for health as, as language, as a term, is, pro is produced through anti-Blackness, which is also produced through anti-fatness. Um, and so my, my, my commitment is to move away from the language of health entirely, because not only um, do you not have to commit to health, but there are people in the world, namely fat black folks who will never be able to, to produce health or to be healthy because it was created at their very expense, right? Um, and so moving through that, that type of conversation or moving through that type of understanding of, of health, I don't really feel a need to engage folks who, who talk about health in a very bioessentialist way uh, because it only reproduces the very same um, harm that, that people are, are, are using or reproduces rather the very same logics that people are using to marginalize or, or oppress um, fat folks in general. I hope that that answered your question. Oh, no, I did. Are you cleared? <laughs> Thank you, Deshaun. Um, Reagan, did you want to add anything to that? No, I, I think that was brilliant and perfect and doesn't need anything from me. Um, well, I want to actually end on that note because I think it's a um, thank you for that cre uh, question, um, Christelle. It was it's actually a perfect lead into the next webinar in the series, which is Dr. Kat Pazé, who is um, um, uh, a public health specialist and professor and fast study scholar and all many things who will be talking to us specifically about um, the medical industry and the media's coverage of COVID-19 in ways that problematize fat and, um, and you know, and um, stereotype and scapegoat fat people. So, um, so we may actually lead off with Deshaun's answer at the beginning of that next webinar because I think it's kind of a perfect flow in. So thank you. Um, thank you both for your time. Once again, thank you to everyone for joining us today. This webinar will be available on YouTube, including um, some of the things that we've referenced um, here today that um, that you will find in the captions on YouTube. And our next webinar with Dr. Kat Pause will be April 13th at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So um, registration for that will open soon. You can find the registration link on our um, you can go to nafa.org slash webinars or you can um, you'll be able to find it on our Facebook events soon and then also save the date for April 24th which will be the third in the series uh, that is a Saturday at 11 a.m pacific time and the members of um, several members of the nobody is disposable coalition will be joining us at that time to talk about their super important work around protecting fat people in care guidelines and vaccine access and several other amazing things that they do so that will be our uh, activism portion of the COVID series. So, and then of course, we'll be announcing many activities, many more webinars and many other activities for our first annual Fat Liberation Month coming in May, 2021. So please stay um, stay tuned and stay on the lookout for more about that. Thank you to our guests, Reagan Chastain and Deshaun Harrison. And on behalf of the NAFA Board of Directors and the Future of NAFA Committee, I thank you all for your support of NAFA. We'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks so much for having me. This was amazing.